from a feasibility perspective, allow for the right public open space, allow for the right garden area lots, you know, allow for all of those things up front, you know, sit with an architect and understand how far can you stretch some of these things as well. So a lot of places where I see a lot of people making mistakes is Hello and welcome to Help Me Buy Property Podcast. Today we are going to talk about development feasibilities and how to identify the risks. Now these are divided into two parts. The first part is the three key things to consider when doing a feasibility study. We are also going to talk about the cash on cash returns and the internal rate of returns, the ER that Cheryl talks about. We'll also talk about the factors that come into play in identifying a perfect GRV or gross realized value. We are also going to talk about the importance of knowing the quality of your product and the persona of the owner that you're going to sell this property to. The net saleable area and the gross floor area. So stay tuned and wait till the very end. We're going to talk about all of these things in that, this episode today. Hello, Cheryl. How are you today? I am fantastic, Moss. It's always great to be here to talk property, property development. And one of our favorite topics when we're talking about property development is Feasibilities. Yes. And it's a good segue. I think we were talking about feasibilities all along. And so talking that on the podcast, it's it's definitely a blessing. I think we hear on our own Facebook groups, on, you know, networking events, everyone talks about feasibilities, right? You know, people show the stick the feasibilities to your face, you know, every time they're asking for money, they're raising money. They are selling off sites. They are selling off option contracts, and so it's very, very important that people do understand not just the feasibility from doing it themselves perspective, but also from you know assessing the sites. You know whether they should be investing in some of these things or not. Yeah. So the feasibility is basically when you ask, "Does this deal stack?" Yes. Yes. Or in simple terms, you know, when I am explaining this to the clients, I say to people that feasibility in the simple sense is, does the number work on paper? And if they work on paper, they'll definitely work in real life. Or they should work in real life, not definitely work in real life. They need to work on paper before they can actually work in real life. Okay. Or if I simplify it more, if you look at a site... And you do your due diligence and the council allows you to develop this today and the builder builds it today, the sales agent sells it today. Do you make the return that you desire today? I think, you know, basically that's what, you know, is the simplest explanation of the feasibility. Yeah. And that's, I mean, what makes a feasibility? A feasibility at the end of the day is sort of a guesstimate, right? It's a as good as possible guesstimate, but just, just just like with anything else, you know, the numbers that you plug into the feasibility is going to be absolutely critical to see whether it's close to what you end up getting or not even anywhere close. Because realistically, you could miss very big critical parts of the feasibility and it send your project winding, spiraling, spiraling down. So, Okay, let's dive into the wild, wild world of feasibility, shall we, my friends? 100%. And so what does good look like in a feasibility? We have talked about what should a feasibility do, but what does good look like in the feasibility? How do you measure success when it comes to feasibilities? Oh, what do you mean by good? But good, I mean, big numbers look good, but we, we want to see big profit that looks even gooder. Yes, gooda. I think my son says that all the time, gooda, besta. <laughs> but this is this is a very interesting point, right? A feasibility could show a million dollar profit and it could still be a worse deal in the life, right? Because ultimately what you need to see is the amount of risk that you're taking in order to deliver that million dollars, right? And so the three key things that we t- talk about in our developments lingo um, I call it developerese, you know, like, you know, uh, legalese are, you know, the profit on cost, the cash on cash return and the internal rate of return or the err uh, that everyone talks about. So let, let's kick that off. Profit on cost, Cheryl, very quickly talk to us. What is this margin on cost or profit on cost? Profit, profit on cost. Okay. So let's, let's go back to basics. The main thing when 
I'm going to wind back a little bit in terms of feasibility. The main things that that make up a, a feasibility is what are you going to sell your properties for? We'll just talk about build to sell. We won't talk about sort of build and hold right now. What are you going to sell these things for, which ends up being your gross revenue? What is it going to cost you in total? So your total development costs. So whatever your revenue is, and I'm talking really high level, let's not consider GST and all of that. Your revenue minus your total development costs, which includes your land and every single cost it it, it, it expenses it takes to get the approvals, the bill to get it sold, everything else, total development costs, profit, net profit is basically what what is left behind after that. And not taking into account any sort of tax and all of that, let's just say high level. Gross, what are you going to sell it for? What does it cost you? What do I have left in in the pocket? So the amount that you have left in your pocket Divided by total development costs is your profit on cost. Perfect. And so every time, you know, people hear margin on cost or profit on cost, the viewers and the listeners need to understand is that this is not cash on cash returns. This is uh, a developer's lingo of saying whether, the, um, whether it hits the benchmark, right? Everyone talks about this magical 20% margin on cost or 20%, you know, profit on cost. The key thing is on cost, okay? So the lower the cost, the bigger the margin, the higher the revenue, the bigger the margin, right? So it's important that when you are assessing your risks, not only you are testing out the revenues, and of course, you'll go into a lot more detail, but not only you are testing out the revenues, but you're also testing out the cost. So you're not missing anything out when you're coming up to that magical number of 20% margin on cost, okay? So that's number one. Number two is cash on cash returns. So if you think about cash on cash returns, cash on cash returns basically means the amount of money that you're going to bring into the deal and how much profit are you going to get out of the deal. Okay? And this could be different depending on how are you structuring your developments. You know, I keep saying this, that developments, any development can be profitable if you structure it right and if you finance it right. And if you play along, right, it's a game of structures and, you know, uh, and cash flow, basically, you know, all the developments are. So if you are generating a particular cash on cash return for that side, that would also dictate whether this site is profitable or not. Okay. Typically, you know, as a general rule of thumb, a 20% margin on cost should be somewhere around 70%, 69 to 70% cash on cash return. Now, again, understand this, that this cash on cash return is the cash on cash return on the whole site. And so it's not just cash on cash return in a single year or multiple years. So the longer you take, the less you make, right? And, you know, that would be a good segue to talk about error or, you know, the annualized cash on cash returns. But one more thing which is quite important to understand is there is a relationship between all of these three things that we are going to talk about today at the start of this conversation. Because if you don't understand those relationships, you might think that the site might be hitting, you know, 25 or 30% margin on cost, but it would still be a poor deal. Like, and we'll go into that, you know, stick around and we'll go into that a bit more detail later in the episode. Talk to us a bit about Err, or the internal rate of return, or analyzed cash return, Cheryl. What is that? Err, and I love how it does make give you that that sort of feeling when you look at the numbers and you're like, yeah, it's fantastic. It's going to give me twenty percent return, and then you realize it takes five years to get. And so, if you split that up over five years, it's not a very impressive return at all. So it gives you that err feeling. So it. It's important when you are looking at returns to sort of look at how long a project's going to take and how long it's taking you to get that return for you to assess if it is at the end of the day a good deal or not. I want to just touch back on cash on cash return is that the reason why you also that that's also an important metrics to to work off is be, because you want to take into take advantage of leveraging your finance. So the more that you're able to leverage your, 
your finance and the less that you put into a deal, then the cash on cash return is going to be higher. Right. So if you get a really good LVR where you don't have to put in as much money, your cash on cash, the uh, cash on cash return is going to be higher. If you've been able to manufacture equity into a site before you even go into construction, say you put a DA on a site and you've been able to increase it by, you know, five hundred thousand dollars in 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 value, and maybe you don't even have to put in much money at all, then the cash on cash return is going to be phenomenal. So, I personally like the cash and cash return, but also looking at the internal rate of return on on that cash and cash return. Definitely, definitely. And I totally agree. I think, you know, if you think about some of these relationships, you know, between these three measures of success or the outcomes that you're trying to achieve, 20% margin on cost, is it better than 15% margin on cost? No, in on face value, it's not right. But if you think about it, and you say, well, you're going to get 20% margin on cost over three years versus 15% margin on cost over 12 months. Of course, the cash on cash returns on that 15% would be a lot better or the internal rate of return on the annualized cash on cash return would be a lot better than, you know, margin on cost of even 20 or 25% over three years. Okay. And so, you know, some of these intricacies or anomalies that happens when you're looking at the deals are very, very important. Also, how the deal is structured, you know, where is the money raised? How much is the money raised for, right? I was talking to this particular client before and I said to them that the deal might be a great deal from your perspective, but when you look at the numbers, the, that would be way too much risk in the deal. And I'll use this as, a, um, as an example um, for this particular client. He had a deal on the table where a person was offering them 28% cash and cash return every year. Okay, and I was like, well, that's too good to be true. That's just crazy, right? And when you look at the feasibility, they are working at literally 12% margin on cost. And so from a, lend- from a person who is lending out the money to the project, they think that this is a deal of the lifetime, right? But when you think about the amount of risk that the project is taking and the developer is taking because they are stuck, you know, naturally what they're doing is they're pushing more money towards raising this, you know, funds from outside so that they can take an exit, which does not leave a lot of, it does not leave a lot of meat in the deal, right? If the project is running at, say, 11% margin on cost, understand that, you know, majority of the times, you know, 5% is the contingency, right? And so if you double the contingency, that's it, your profit is basically eroded. So you need to think about this in a very logical sense. You know, as to which angle are you looking at the deal from as well. Let's take a bit more deeper look into this. And so one thing that I want to basically discuss is, you know, what are the key items uh, to look out for in the feasibilities? And so let's talk about the gross revenue or the GRV typically or the gross realized value that people talk about. Let's explore and talk a bit about that as to what does that mean? Um, in simple layman term. We just put in whatever number you want to sell the properties for. That's the best outcome. Yes, yeah, so like, I like this number here. It looks very pretty. I will put it here. There you go. And it automatically just happened. No? No. Okay. Right. There's a bit more, there's a bit more science behind it. GRV, I'd like to, to get your, your experience on how you, you determine the GRV of your, your product. Look, there is, there is a lot of things that comes into play when you're talking about the gross realized value of the overall site. Of course, the size of the, the house or whatever you're building, the per square meter sells in the area of a similar product and identifying is your product the best market fit as well. I think these three things comes together to identify a GRV. Okay. Of course, there is some sort of conservatism that you would build into it when you are, you know, working up a GRV. A conservatism doesn't mean that you're going down the path of being, you know, a lot of people, when I see them doing the feasibility, they might discount the GRV by 10% or 15%, right? I would say to people that the conservatism means that you are being real and honest to yourself. Okay. You're not being overly optimistic about the product that you're building. Okay. A real and honest and a fair price basically means that something that was selling there 12 months ago, okay, not yesterday, 
Okay, so that's the conservatism that you're talking about. Or six months ago, that's the conservatism that you're talking about. Understanding the product market fit when you're establishing a GRV is very, very important because just because you've built a beautiful house does not mean that people will appreciate a, a beautiful house in the area. Maybe the, the market does not dictate a higher price point for, for a nicer house in those localities. And so bringing the right product is very, very important when you're talking about GRVs. Same is the case with the size of the house. Okay, I was having that discussion with, with, with a particular client who was trying to do a development themselves. And I said to them, bigger does not always mean better. Okay, I've done developments where four bedroom, two bathroom and three bedroom, two bathroom sells at exactly the same price. It does not change. Okay, three bedroom, two bathroom with an extra living. That's really interesting. Yeah. And so it's important that you understand that, you know, you're not overcapitalizing, you know, you're not building 28 or a 30 meter square meter house where you can basically work with 25 and still get the same relatively similar GRV. And so you're not overcapitalizing or, you know, you know, building a significantly bigger product. And so when you're thinking about GRV in the truest sense, of course, what you're doing is you're looking at the number of properties that you're building or the, or the site that you're building in. And you are understanding the value of each and every house. Okay. You're not averaging this out. You are not, you know, multiplying this by an average price point. You're looking at exactly what the size of the house is. What is the per square meter sale of a similar product? How fast is that product selling? And then establishing a GRV against it. Okay. One more important thing in relation to GRV from my perspective is that, you know, people naturally think that higher yield is always better. And so, you know, on a site where you can build two bedroom, you know, six townhouses is better because, you know, two bedrooms are getting an X number or X resale versus, you know, a three bedder or a four bedder. The speed of the resales um, and understanding what market are you catering to? Is it an owner occupier? Is it an investor market? Is it a high end market? Is very, very important. And so just because you know, someone has established the GRV in an area for two bedders does not naturally mean that you would be able to get those sales as well. And so play safe, play to the major market unless you are planning to go into the niche space and then build to the need of that need niche space. You know, I call this needs analysis. It's a very, very important and people, you know, spend two seconds establishing GRV, you know. I've been working on this particular deal for the last three weeks and we are still trying to establish GRV uh, because, you know, the product that we are building, bringing out is slightly upper end, whereas, you know, there is nothing sold in the area, that sort of quality. And so you're like, should we really bring this product out at that quality, knowing that, you know, the market may or may not give us the premium that we are asking for in the, in, you know, because the build price is definitely more. Yeah. And I, I'd say, you know, find an agent or some agents and make them your, your good friends who will give you you know, really honest feedback about the type of product and the pricing that they that they feel they can sell it for. So I always I always say, make the agent your friend because they're the particularly if you're going to use someone who's going to market your your product, you want to make it easy for them. You want to be able to have them be able to say, "Yep, I could sell this any day of the week because I know that this is the type of client that and this is what they're needing." And this is the price point that they're at. Don't make it difficult for yourself, and and get a good get a good idea of similar types of product. But you know, you will be delivering a newer product. Don't go too crazy in escalating the the end the end value. However, like more said, you know, don't be so conservative that your numbers just don't that don't work at all. It is about saying if I've sold it in today's market taking a little bit of, you know, you always have to have a contingency in your feasibility. Don't forget a contingency. Things do always not go to plan. Yes. They will yes. always not go to plan. <laughs> I don't think in any project, every, anything has not broken or not gone to plan at all. There, there, there are a million factors in the development and something does, you know, something just goes haywire. I think development definitely tested tests your patience, right? You know, you need to be a really, really patient person or you would potentially die of a heart attack or you would have blood pressure and cholesterol combined together. You know, if you can't handle the pressure that the councils and the LVRs and the banks and, you know, all these consultants and builders basically, you know, give you while you're doing the developments, right? So you, you want to make sure that you've got 
good stress management skills, you've got to make sure that you've got good people management skills and you want to make sure that you've got a good head of hair to start off with. Definitely. I, th- I think I think that's very valid. I think that's 100% very, very valid because if you think about it, you need to be in a solution-focused mode all the time because, you know, uh, you can't go out looking for problems because you will find problems and there would always be problems. And, you know, I, you know we'll, we'll share some stories along the way about a lot of the problems and how do you find solutions around some of these problems as well. And I'm sure every developer who's out there uh, would have countless examples of, you know, things that they have done in order to bypass and navigate a lot of these red tape that developers are facing on a day-to-day basis. That's what really makes development so interesting. Right? But it is for everyone. Like it's really, you know, I speak to my husband, my husband's like, is it like this all the time for every project? I'm like, yes, yes, it is. <laughs> He's like, how do you still think so chilled about it? And I'm like, you just control what you can control and other things you just don't have control of. You just have to go flow. Like, like if you let every single thing get to you, you literally will have a, a nervous meltdown. 100%, 100%. I think one more thing that I also want to talk about in relation to GRV is the quality. I hear people throwing the words medium quality, high end quality, low end quality. It's such a relative term. It's such a relative term. I think you you ask a real estate agent and they'll always say, oh, I want a high quality finished product. You know, well, define what high quality is. What does that mean in relation to an inclusion list? You know, uh, and so everyone's quality is different. I want the crappy quality stuff. Thank you. I choose the crappy quality. Everybody wants quality. Like quality, like you said, it is it is overused. And and are they saying it? I want the more expensive stuff. Yes, of course. Yeah. Everyone wants, you know, golden toilets and, you know, golden showers and you know, silver, you know, door handles and You can keep your golden showers more than your golden toilets. Oh thank you. Look I mean there. <laughs> But that, that's how it is. Like, you know, it's very, very important that you understand what quality that you are building, right? You know, you don't need to uh, do a development with an emotional attachment to it. I think a lot of people that I see who are first-time developers, you know, they were emotionally attached to the place. They're they are imagining themselves living here. I was like, you're not living here. You're building it for an adult downsizer for example you know identify that persona of a client that you're going to sell this product to right it's very very important that you understand that and you build the house based on their feedback their usability their needs yeah and so if you're going to you know think about oh i need you know, ensuites suites in every room and oh i need uh, i can live with a smaller entry point but i need bigger living space as well you know tough luck because you know the person who's going to buy this may have a wheelchair and they might need a wider access. And so you need to identify the persona of the product, of the owner that you're going to sell this to and identify the quality, identify the product market fit based on that. And that would give you a very true GRV in any, any market that you're dealing with, in any uh, possible market. Build coverages. Let's talk about that. I think we have touched on it slightly. Um, in relation to the build coverage of the gross floor area that everyone talks about. Are we talking about sort of the net saleable area? Is that what we... Yes, potentially, yes, yes. Okay, so net saleable area would be, say, if you're talking about an apartment or whichever, often the net saleable area excludes the balconies and garage and so on. It's what is your internal. So that's... Often, if you're comparing apples with apples, often if you've got one block of apartments here and you've got another block of apartments two blocks down, someone might say it costs $1.5 million for a two-bedroom apartment, 80 square meters. You go, oh, okay, well, that's, you know, 1.5 million divided by 80 square meters is my per square meter rate. And then that, that gets used as its sort of ballpark I'm going to compare it with unit and the other block to two floors down, uh, two streets down, and and that's you know ten thousand dollars a square meter more. Why is why is that? So, understanding net saleable area 
is really helpful when you are pricing things up in terms of your GRV as well, because that's what people, buyers are, are quite sophisticated these days. And that, that those are some of the things that they'll look at. They'll sort of go, is it worth, is the product that you have worth more in the, on a per square meter rate? Yes, yes, definitely. And also, I think, I mean, you know, one of the key things to also understand from a feasibility perspective, especially when you're doing it for the first time is, you know, rather than being a lot more optimistic, be a bit more conservative. Okay. Of course, you know, when you're going to do the massing diagrams, you're going to, you're planning to go to the council, you know, you would encroach, you know, you would try to push the boundaries, et cetera. But from a feasibility perspective, allow for the right, right public open space, allow for the right, you know, garden area lots, you know, allow for all of those things up front, you know, sit with an architect and understand, you know, how far can you stretch some of these things as well. So um, a lot of the, a lot, a lot of places where I see a lot of people making mistakes is, you know, they'll look at the land size, uh, without looking at anything else, they'll, especially in Victoria, they'll just take 60% because, you know, 40% is the garden rule or the pass area requirement, or, you know, they'll take 45%. You know, the general rule of thumb in a lot of these instances do not apply because you have to take the zonings into consideration. You have to take the offsets into consideration, et cetera. And we'll talk about a lot of these things when you're talking about the due diligence side of things. Um, but, you know, these areas dictate the price point, not only the price point, but also the build price of of the product that you're going to bring out there. So it's important to understand some of these things quite, you know, religiously. Next item on the list, construction cost. I'll let you drive this. This is your fun part. Everyone wants to talk about construction costs. It feels like you're throwing, it's like darts, you know, playing darts. But after about 10 beers with construction costs, at the moment, they definitely have gone gone a bit wayward. And if you enter, you know, fingers crossed, you you're going into a, con- a construction contract. You hope to, <laughs> you know, you sort of do all your hail marys and everything else, cross your cross your hands, toes, and everything that your builder makes it to the end. It's it's incredibly important that you get at least three, three. T- you know, you tender out your build that you're getting quotes that you're comparing apples with apples. So important that uh, admittedly, one of the things that I find really frustrating is because different builders quote differently and you really have to sit down with almost a fine tooth comb to go through almost line by line to ensure that you are comparing apples with apples, that you are comparing what is included and what the inclusions are, what the exclusions are, and and know that I think it's really really easy to get caught out. It's so easy to get caught out if you are unfamiliar with construction, the costs, what could potentially blow out. You know, and this is I I can't say there's any other way apart from learning from experience with this because it's so hard to cover every single part of the construction contract or construction costs. Uh, Let's talk about that. Especially when you are doing the feasibility, right? Because, you know, you don't have working drawings, you know, the builder is not going to give you, you know, um, they they would have a finger in the air sort of estimate, you know, coming back to you. You know, none of this is, you don't have the engineering, you don't have the energy reports, you don't have any of that to basically dictate what the price is going to look like. So, of course, a lot of this is going to come from experience of what you have done before or the experience of the developer that is there in the deal, okay? But it's also important to understand that a lot of people, when they think about construction costs, they, they use a single blended rate and just apply it across the whole site, right? I almost split construction cost into four or five various different areas, okay? And so there is the build cost, the actual build cost of the place. And um, I think a lot of builders would be quite, you know, capable in giving you what the quality and the build cost would look like, okay? Where a lot of these things, when you talk about construction cost goes haywire, is when you start talking about, of course, the quality, et cetera, all of that too. But when you start talking about the civils and the site prep, when you start talking about you know, the fencing in the driveways and the landscaping because, you know, none of the builders would usually include those. 
and then the cost to the DA side of things, because of course, you know, builder does not include headworks and building permits and subdivisions and connection costs and all of those things. And so while these things are quite little, if you are not going down that route and being that detail in your feasibilities, you will be caught out on these. Okay. And you can understand that, you know, some of the civil, some of the site prep, you know, could be huge, you know, depending on, you know, the slope of the site or, uh, you know, where the services are or, you know, um, the, 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 the meter drop or the type of the slab that goes on the top. So a lot of this is quite, this is where the contingency plays typically, right? Because, you know, the builder doesn't know what's underneath the land. You know, you don't know typically where a lot of these services are. Sometimes even if you know where the services are and you're doing that due diligence up front quite in detail, uh, sometimes you dig and you realize that it's not there or it's not the type of the thing that you would you were wondering, right? So all of these examples are there. And so it's important that while you are talking and looking at the construction cost, you're not looking at a stock standard average or a relative average across old houses. You know, you're putting a bit of science behind this. You're splitting these costs separately. You're going out and speaking to, you know, various different people in relation to demolition, in relation to civils, in relation to site prep, in relation to headworks. Again, you know, when I say headworks, I'm talking about all these connection costs and building permits and subdivisions, et cetera, all of these things. And of course, the DA cost. And there is a whole list of things within the DA cost that we would talk about um, when we are going to talk about the due diligence side of things. Thank you for listening to us today. Let us know how did you find part one. We covered a lot in part one, that, but there is more value coming in part two next week. We are going to talk about the construction cost and all about the construction cost. How do you split the construction cost into four or five different areas? You're also going to talk about how to manage the builder and that where does the builder comes into the feasibility side of things, the type of expenses that you can expect that you need to factor in into the feasibility. We're going to go into a lot more detail to know enough information about the costs of your site to understand or to make a call on whether you should be going ahead on acquiring this property or not. Understanding the holding costs and how they are calculated, the pre and the post feasibility returns and how majority of the developers get confused into the pre-feasibility returns and the post-feasibility returns and much more. So stay tuned. (laughs) 